Before this video begins, I would like to give a quick thank you to my Asbantium level patrons Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Ghosts! I like ghosts. Do you like ghosts? Doctor Who likes ghosts, and it has told a number of interesting ghost stories across all sorts of mediums. Stories like Chimes of Midnight, Hyde, The Unquiet Dead, and The Haunting of Villa Diodati explore the world of the paranormal in Doctor Who's usual fashion. But possibly the best example of a Doctor Who ghost story is the series 9 2 parter Under the Lake and Before the Flood. This terrifying tale puts the Doctor and Clara in an underwater base, being terrorised by mysterious ghosts. With all sorts of time travel chaos ensuing, series 9 is a bit polarising, but it's safe to say that this particular story is one of the most universal beloved. But what makes it so special? Why is it such a standout story? Well as always, that's what I'm here to find out. So grab a fistful of ectoplasm and get ready because it's time for a deep dive into Under the Lake and Before the Flood. Hello sailors! I really enjoy how the crew of the drum bass are introduced at the beginning. It almost feels like something out of Stargate Atlantis, this group of very different and defined characters. They're all given little moments to find in their character traits, even Moran gets developed quite well despite, you know, him being a doomed character. Right from the beginning you can see Lund's role as the sign of a cast, you can see Pritchard's corporate selfishness, and even O'Donnell gets a little moment of cheekily surrendering to Moran's rational, grounded approach since he refuses to entertain the idea of this mysterious object being a spaceship. I've not seen technology like this. Please don't say on Earth. On Earth before? They all feel very established and come across as characters who have been working together for a long time before the start of the episode. It's not like one of those Doctor Who stories where the supposed crew of a ship or a base have no chemistry and come across as having only existed five minutes before the episode began. This crew has an existing feeling of familiarity in clear roles, so it's really engaging to see and helps make you like them more from the beginning. Like I said, it feels like something from one of those shows like Stargate, almost making me wish we could have had a whole spin-off of this crew as they do with all sorts of weird stuff underwater. Within a pacey and entertaining three minutes, we understand the setting, meet the crew, and discover the ghosts. It's absolutely everything you need from a Doc 2 cold open. And it's clinical but perfect. It's like bam, setting, bam, characters, bam, monsters. It's quick, it's clean, and it's a masterclass of opening a story like this. The opening also serves as a great example of Clara's growing recklessness and dependence on the adventures. We can see this as the Doctor's outside of the TARDIS and she's still inside the ship, desperate to go to more planets and go on more adventures. I do want to quickly note how great this visual effect is. Having the depth of the TARDIS on clear display, rather than it just being the green screen or backing board they usually have to use when the characters are entering or leaving the TARDIS. Instead, this uses clever framing and editing to have Capaldi on the actual drum set, while Coleman is on the TARDIS set and they combine it seamlessly to make it all look like it's in the same shot, in the same place. It helps to really drive home the crazy dimensions of the TARDIS in a way very few episodes have ever been able to do. But on a narrative level, it also shows how Clara is growing more and more reliant on the TARDIS as escapism. She's letting it consume her life and she finds any excuse to go off on adventures and to see alien worlds. You know, she claims she left her sunglasses behind so she has to go back. Like I've mentioned before in these reviews, when Clara loses Danny Pink, she goes off the deep end and loses touch with her home and her own humanity. I want another adventure. This story continues the wider story arc of Clara becoming more like the Doctor and acting more recklessly because she has nothing to lose. It becomes like an addiction for her and she can't stop chasing the next high, even when it threatens her life. Right from the beginning, she's almost excited at this abandoned base, this mystery to solve and the potential danger that comes with that. Oh yeah, you see, this is more like it. The script even outright addresses Clara's obsession with time and space travels, with the Doctor stopping her and giving her a bit of a reality check, trying to talk her down and remind her of her mortality. Even so, don't, don't go native. The Doctor's advice of Clara needing a hobby or another relationship is framed as a bit of a comedic piece of dialogue, but there's actually a lot of truth in it. Previously, Clara had described the Doctor as her hobby, and now that she doesn't have her relationship with Danny tethering her to Earth, there's nothing really left for her to go back to, which is why she keeps heading down this path of trying to become like the Doctor. It's a scene that reminds us of the Doctor's duty of care for Clara, how he's trying to be responsible and not allowing her to get too carried away with all these adventures. He enjoys them all just as much as she does. 
does, but he also knows all the risks that come with it. He knows what it's done to people like Katarina, Adric, Rose and Donna. They lost their lives, their homes, their memories, all because of their travels with the Doctor. And 12 doesn't want Clara to face a similar fate. It's the scene of him trying to settle her down, but it also shows that he's probably the worst incarnation for this kind of talk. So can I stop now? Please, please do. 12 is a deeply caring person, all incarnations are, but his social inadequacies are part of the reason Clara's fate ultimately happens. He can't really get through to her during scenes like this because he's socially awkward and can't handle these talks. They're framed more comedically and not in the serious intervention way Clara needs to be talked to for her own good. He's trying to give her this out, trying to slow her down, but he's not equipped to do so and that ultimately makes things worse because he's kind of like an enabler for her obsession and addiction. I absolutely adore the underwater based setting of this story, which was established as a way to prevent the ghost story from becoming too cliche. Despite it being closer to home than space, the ocean remains very mysterious and almost more terrifying than space itself. We know so little about it and there's something about the constant threat of water itself that makes these bases incredible settings for media, especially those of the sci-fi variety. I've always enjoyed this kind of setting and this story creates a very striking and industrious look for the base. It perfectly achieves that sense of futuristic industrialism, looking all sleek and sci-fi, whilst also looking very practical with its construction, kind of like the Impossible Planet, creating a base that actually feels like it was designed and built to be used and lived in, rather than, you know, just being a pretty setting for a story. The underwater base doesn't bother with loads of unnecessary windows, those only really exist in the recreational dining area, which makes sense because it would give the crew a sense of openness to relax. No matter how reinforced they may be, windows aren't really something these kinds of bases would choose to have because of the potential for damage compared to the sturdy steel walls we see more of throughout the base. It all feels like a very realistic location and the production designers really put clear thought into these little details, making sure everything comes across as genuine and authentic. The lighting and cinematography also help to create a very oppressive and haunting atmosphere, like in those lingering shots of the seemingly abandoned base at the beginning of the episode. And when the lights of the base go into night mode, everything suddenly becomes so much more creepy and claustrophobic. It does an excellent job of playing on our innate fear of the dark because it's all cold and shadowy, you have no idea what could be lurking around the corner. And what is lurking around every corner? Ghosts! When it came to planning out Series 9, showrunner Stephen Moffat wanted to have the Doctor face off against ghosts in their more conventional form, that, you know, being the vengeful spirits of the dead. It makes sense then that he would turn to writer Toby Whithouse to make this a reality. After all, Whithouse had played with vampires in Series 5 and a creepy hotel in Series 6, along with his successful show Being Human being very supernatural themed. Whithouse does a fantastic job with these ghosts, but they really come to life thanks to the effects department. They have such a creepy and ethereal look about them, not fully see-through but still translucent enough to feel like genuine ghosts. Their lack of eyes are especially terrifying, with these deep empty pits removing any sense of friendliness and humanity. It's also unsettling how they move, this measured walk, never running, never rushing, just calmly moving towards their target. I like how the episode lays out the rules of these ghosts nice and quickly, with that great chase scene of the Doctor and Clara running away. We get the establishment of these ghosts are directly linked to the mysterious words, how they're able to hold metal objects and pass through walls. It's an efficient use of the Doctor and Clara's first interaction with them, communicating these very ghostly elements of the monsters before also showing us their main limitation of not being able to enter the Faraday cage in the base. This Faraday cage element was inspired by research Whithouse had done for a concept that ultimately didn't get used in being human, but it creates an excellent limitation for the villains here. I also adore how excited the Doctor gets about the potential that these are real actual ghosts. We've seen before that the Doctor refuses to entertain these ideas, but with nothing else to work with, Twelfth is more than happy to believe in ghosts until proven otherwise. After all, they tick all the boxes of traditional ghosts, so why can't they be? They're ghosts! I like how comedic the Doctor is in this episode. He has a lot of funny moments, like when he realises his ability to read sign language has been replaced with the ability to identify flags. And then there's that brilliant cue card scene, which is one of 12's best moments in the whole series. I know some people have gripes with it, but it is consistent with his character, since the Doctor has always struggled with human sensibilities and behaviours. It's not even exclusive to 12. The companion often has to act as a human liaison, someone to keep the Doctor in check and remind the time 
landlord of what's appropriate in any given moment. So this scene is a nice continuation of that approach, as Clara has to select a cue card with the appropriate response for 12 to give, after, you know, being kind of insensitive about Moran being dead. After all, she's his carer. She cares, so he doesn't have to. The cue cards themselves are fun little meta jabs at Doctor Who tropes, like the Doctor being frustrated at people getting captured, along with a reference to Sarah Jane getting dumped in Aberdeen instead of Croydon. It's a great comedic scene to ease tensions and add a little bit of humour into a pretty bleak episode, so I appreciate it a lot. The comedy is further shown as the Doctor immediately disregards Pritchard, who introduces himself by going on all about the oil. I think it's a nice touch that all the crew wear uniforms but Pritchard doesn't, immediately establishing him as a bit of an other, an outsider, because he's there as a corporate figure, a capitalist stereotype obsessed with profits and making money. And, as we all know, the Doctor never gets along with these kinds of people. So it's nice that Twelve has this dislike of him from the moment they meet. It's okay, I understand. You're an idiot. The Doctor constantly talks down to him and treats him as lesser, which creates a fun dynamic, because Pritchard was so willing to act a stereotype that Twelve has no concerns about dismissing him as such. Yes, well otherwise- sorry, why is this man still talking to me? Richard isn't really meant to be a deep or developed character, since he's there to be killed off, so he serves his role well and his death scene is absolutely terrifying. He's in a floodable airlock after going out into the water, and he doesn't have his helmet on anymore, so he's completely at the mercy of the water flooding in when Moran opens it. Now remember, the base is so deep underwater that it needs artificial days and nights. The pressure of the water would probably kill Moran instantly, but if it didn't, he would face a horrific drowning as the gallons pour into the airlock in his suit, along with his mouth killing him in such a brutal way. I know I keep bringing up the impossible planet, but it really does remind me of Scooty's death, who was also a victim of the elements, the sudden depressurization of the base itself. Hell, there's even the shot of him floating outside the window, just like Scooty was in that episode. Pritchard's death is a terrifying statement of intent, not only reminding you of the base being at the mercy of the lake itself, but also showing you what the ghosts are truly capable of despite their physical limitations. They're working out how to use the base against us. They're even able to threaten the TARDIS itself, causing the familiar cloister bells and the friendly setting to be bathed in ominous red lights, which is an unsettling visual similar to the end of Turn Left, which established the high stakes of the story to come. There's a fantastic, thrilling sequence of the characters all working together to bait the ghosts into the Faraday cage, with the Doctor coordinating the efforts using a map. It's shot and edited in a very slick way, with the characters overlapping in smooth camera movements, shifting perspectives and keeping everything very punchy. And of course, because this is Doctor Who, the plan immediately goes wrong when the ghosts decide to split up to chase multiple targets at the same time. This forces the Doctor to improvise in a nice way, showing how well he can think on his feet to protect Clara from the ghosts chasing her. However, it's also also a great scene for furthering the mystery of the words, since Lun is spared by Pritchard's ghost. This moment is incredibly tense, the music really picking up as Lun cowers in fear, the ghost almost toying with its prey, only to suddenly spare him for seemingly no reason. It's the ideal way of using an action sequence to actually develop and further the plot itself, rather than it just being action for the sake of action. We also get a bit of a hint towards the ultimate solution of the story, with the Clara hologram tricking the ghost into the cage. I always like when Doctor Who stories are sold with seemingly mundane things from earlier in the narrative. It's like how the empty child introduced the nanogenes as, you know, just a little thing in Captain Jack's ship to fix Rose's burns, only for the Doctor to realise, huh, these are actually perfect for solving the gas mask zombie problem. It shows us clear logic in the Doctor's problem solving and thinking, able to draw on these past plans as a solution for the wider issue, rather than, you know, just pulling something random out of thin air. I really like the idea of the ghosts ominously mouthing words throughout the narrative, silently speaking without us being able to understand what they're saying. It's only half an hour into Under the Lake that we get answers, with Cass's lip reading skills translating the seemingly random words. It's the first big mystery of the story to be solved, keeping the pacing ticking along nicely without overloading on mysteries and unanswered questions. The words turn out to be coordinates, with a really fun science lesson style practical diagram by the Doctor as he explains the coordinates and arrives sword. Not only is it a great way to put it in simple terms for the crew, it's also a good explanation for the viewer themselves, showing us how the coordinates actually make sense rather than just being vague words. This scene also answers the question as to why the ghosts are trying to kill the crew, because it amplifies the signal further, although we still don't get all the answers as the Doctor still tries to guess why they exist in the first place. More questions. Everything is solved, just more questions.
The idea of the ghost mouthing these silent words is what led Withouse to develop Cass, the deaf woman who can read lips. I really appreciate how Cass shows the ability to diversify roles and create representation without making it too gimmicky or treating it like a joke. She's simply a character who happens to be deaf, and Sophie Stone does a great job of the character, especially when Cass stands up to the Doctor, taking charge and showing her priority is the safety of her crew. She's not some selfish or stubborn leader like you often get in these stories, she genuinely understands that they're out of their depth down here, and they need to get specialists in to deal with such a situation. It's a very good example of leadership, and something I wish Doctor Who side characters would do more often. Cass isn't being cowardly, she's actually being quite smart and rational. There's only a small crew against three mysterious killer ghosts. It's a pretty admirable move to just put your hands up and admit, yeah, you know, this is kind of out of our league, you know, we're, we're just off. However, the episode has a pretty good justification for why the characters have to stay. That being that the ghosts summoned a team of paramedics to the base, suggesting they want a way off themselves. So the Doctor is forced to put the base into quarantine for the greater good. And even later on, when the ghosts are confined, the Doctor gives the crew the chance to leave, even stating he would prefer it if they did. But he knows they would rather stay, either out of the desire to protect and serve, or even just the pursuit of knowledge. It's a definitive moment showing the character's own bravery and solidarity. It's their choice to stay. They choose that responsibility themselves, rather than just running away from what they don't know. Throughout the story, Lun is shown to be Cass's signer, her way of communicating with the crew. But as the narrative continues, their relationship is shown to be a lot deeper, with Cass extremely protective of Lun, like when he seems to be about to die by the ghosts. However, the most protective moment is when Lun travels out of the Faraday cage to recover Clara's phone. Okay, didn't need anyone to translate that. Like, Cass and Clara have some great moments there. Since Lun never saw the coordinates and therefore didn't become a target for the villains, he's able to go get the phone. However, when it turns out to be a trap, Clara and Cass have to head out to find him. But naturally, they immediately get split up and Cass starts to get followed by Moran's ghost. This scene is such a genius and brilliant use of Cass's deafness, because she has no idea that the ghost is right behind her. I love how the audio is done here, cutting from the loud axe being dragged along the floor to the complete silence Cass is experiencing. It's a fantastic audio effect that helps put the viewer in her shoes, showing you exactly what her silent life is like. I also really like how she uses the vibrations on the floor to realise Moran is right behind her. She may not be able to hear, but she can still experience those vibrations in her body, and the echolocation visual effect is fantastic, allowing her to map out her surroundings by touch and feeling alone, despite not being able to hear him behind her. It still doesn't become a gimmick, it's instead simply a way of translating her way of life for the audience to properly understand and showing us how a deaf character would deal with a scenario like this and use their senses and surroundings to survive and stay out of danger. I like how distinctive the two parts of this story are, kind of like a Moffat written two-parter where the two halves are very different in tone and setting. Under the Lake is set exclusively in the underwater base, with a very methodical and atmospheric tone. The mystery is slowly explored and fleshed out as the episode deepens, but then before the flood is a lot more open with a 1980s earth setting and more action set pieces heightening the stakes and the intensity of the story. It's a perfect showcase of what two-parters can do with the extended runtime. The characters find the suspended animation chamber and bring it aboard, only for the Doctor to realise he needs to go back to the initial flood and understand what happened, you know, giving them a good excuse to change the settings up. However, he and Clara are separated in a tense scene of the base flooding, creating that great hook for the second part, keeping the pair apart with their own companions, so to speak, and forcing them to each deal with a situation using their own abilities and skills. The cliffhanger of Under the Lake is by far one of the best. Not only does the ending give us that moment of the pair separated by the flooding corridor, but we also have that bombshell reveal of the Doctor as a ghost. It creates such a fantastic tease for the episode to come, suggesting that the Doctor himself somehow dies in the past and manifests as a ghost in the future. By far one of the most memorable cliffhangers in the modern show's entire history. This ghost Doctor is a really interesting aspect of Before the Flood. Doctor, such an honour, I've always been a huge admirer. Right from the get-go, he's presented as different to the others, whispering a list of the characters' names rather than the coordinates. And also, just as a side note, this whole video call thing is done fantastically, including the Doctor changing the orientation of the TARDIS screen to match the phone whenever it changes. But in a general sense, it's a great narrative tool, allowing the characters to interact in this interesting way. I suppose it kind of feels like something the show could have done during lockdown filming, when limited actors were allowed on set at any given time. So a video call like this would have been perfect for that style of filming.
One of the standout scenes in this two-parter is that brilliant bootstrap paradox explanation at the beginning of Before the Flood. Whithouse was surprised to be allowed to keep this scene, and it's a great thing it was retained, because it's so fantastic. However, it was originally going to be quite different, with the early drafts explaining the paradox with the example of a time traveller accidentally killing Leonardo da Vinci as a child and having to forge all of da Vinci's discoveries and achievements using the documents he had brought with him. Da Vinci? This was then changed to the Doctor having a postcard of the Last Supper painting, which in turn inspired the real thing. Before you know, we finally got that Beethoven example the episode uses, due to the establishment of the Doctor loving the electric guitar in The Magician's Apprentice. I think the monologue is a lot better for it, giving us moments like, you know, the intensity comparison, along with that emphatic ending of an electric guitar version of Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> Oh, and it's also the perfect excuse for a rock version of the theme music, which, you know, is absolutely sublime. I love this scene for so many reasons. Not only is it an interesting fourth wall break in monologue almost unheard of in Doctor Who, but it also serves as a very viewer-friendly introduction to the idea of the bootstrap paradox. Sure, Doctor Who has used this paradox incredibly often. It's been a big part of loads of episodes, but it's the entire central focus of Before the Flood, so an introductory scene like this is an effective and engaging explanation of the concept, putting it in very clear and understandable terms for the entire audience. Capaldi's dynamic charisma really makes it shine, and it's just a brilliant scene all around, especially because the 12th Doctor has already been established as giving these kinds of lectures to no real audience, like we saw in Listen, so it fits in with his character to go on this whole speech despite being completely alone in the TARDIS. The bootstrap paradox itself has always fascinated me endlessly, this information loop where something causes itself and leaves you with a question of what the original timeline was. It's kind of like a chicken or the egg situation, but if the egg hatched and then the chicken inside travelled back in time to lay the egg of itself, although actually that's kind of the grandfather of the paradox. But the point still stands, what came first? There are all sorts of solutions proposed, but the bootstrap paradox is a core aspect of time travel because it's such a hard thing to avoid. I like how Before the Flood doesn't get too wrapped up in trying to solve it. The episode just treats the paradox as the brain-bending concept it is, especially at the end where it comes up again. The Doctor realising the solution to the episode was itself a bootstrap paradox. He programmed his hologram ghost because he saw the ghost to begin with, bringing up that question once more of which truly came first and when the Doctor would have first had those ideas. It's a staggeringly beautiful way of involving some harder sci-fi elements with the story and playing with the concepts without the burden of trying to answer them. Instead, keeping it as a novelty ending and a bit of a cliffhanger as you try to wrap your head around it. This question not even the Doctor and Clara can answer. Weirhouse was determined to have the storyline really open up in the second part, drawing inspiration from remote military outposts when creating the deserted village setting of Before the Flood. I love the visuals of this semi-urban wasteland, with the colour grading using a lot of greys and blues to create a very dingy and depressing atmosphere. But you know, I guess it's just Thatcher's England for you. The filming took place at MOD Kerwin, a legitimate military outpost used for training exercises, so it has a very authentic and realistic feeling of being derelict and forgotten about. The buildings are all falling apart with smashed windows and it's all very unsettling, especially with all the fake Soviet branding because of its storyline nature as a replica town for training during the Cold War. It has a similar feeling to Curse of Fenric all the way back in Season 26, which also took place in a military training village like this. It's also quite surreal to see the village intact after first being exposed to it as a completely derelict wreck of rubble and destroyed buildings. It's the perfect setting of Before the Flood, which itself has a pretty oppressive and bleak tone and atmosphere throughout. Yes, the Doctor finding out about his ghost gives him a bit of a crisis, believing that he's meant to die, you know, kind of like the first episode. Capaldi does such an incredible job during this scene. He's a Time Lord faced with his own mortality, knowing he can't do anything to prevent his seemingly inevitable death because of the effect it would have on the entire universe and all of space and time. I know the whole 12 ghost thing is ultimately a fake out, but this is a truly exceptional scene addressing both the Doctor and Clara's feelings on his potential death. The Doctor has a brief moment of sadness and guilt, almost quietly calling back to Ten believing he could do so much more. But then that glimpse of reluctance is gone and he embraces his death. But this is where Clara comes in. Not with me! Die 
fight with whoever comes after me, you do not leave me! It's important to remember that Clara has already been through all this once. She experienced Eleven regenerating and that affected her negatively like we saw in Deep Breath. She's not ready for that to happen again. She doesn't want to go through it all over again, having to say goodbye to yet another face and deal with a brand new person in his place. Of course, she is being a bit selfish in this scene, that's undeniable, but it's also hard to blame her because, you know, he's her best friend. Like she says, she's not ready yet. She's bargaining and pleading, desperate to stop him dying in any way possible, even if it breaks all the rules. It's the exact kind of behaviour we later see from the Doctor himself when the roles are swapped and he wants to save Clara, despite all the damage it could do. Capaldi and Coleman act their hearts out in this beautifully bittersweet scene, and I adore it so much. You can really understand the deep love these two characters have for each other and the lengths they'll go to to not lose each other, so it's a great aspect of the wider Series 9 hybrid story. Arc. I'm changing history to save Clara. A much less lucky character is O'Donnell, a doomed would-be companion akin to Rita in Withouse's previous episode, The God Complex. This two-parter takes the interesting approach of making O'Donnell a big fan of the Doctor, much like Osgood and Malcolm in previous episodes. I suppose she's like an audience surrogate because we've all probably wondered how we would react to being in a Doctor Who adventure. It's bigger on the inside, it's bigger on the inside, it's bigger! <laughs> it's a very understandable and realistic touch for O'Donnell to be a bit starstruck at the chance to finally meet this legendary figure she read so much about as part of military intelligence. She even name drops companions and events in the Doctor's past, although I hate how fans have latched onto the whole Minister of War thing. We don't need to find out what that is or what it means, just let it be a mystery, an ominous name the Doctor will one day meet off screen. Anyway, I really like O'Donnell's relationship with the Doctor, they get along really well and you can even see the bashful pride she feels when the Doctor praises her for putting the base back into day mode. Remember, this is her hero, it's a huge compliment for her to receive and more than Christie communicates this nervous glee just wonderfully. It's a brief moment further characterising her as a fan of the Doctor, someone who really respects and trusts him immensely on reputation alone. O'Donnell, you're really the Doctor, I'm a huge fan. O'Donnell is the right way to do a character like this, not like Osgood, who was a huge caricature and generally just pretty insufferable. O'Donnell, on the other hand, is a well-rounded, developed character who isn't necessarily defined by her love and admiration of the Doctor. O'Donnell makes a great temporary companion who could have easily become the full thing if she wasn't killed off in this story. In hindsight, it's really sad when the Doctor tries to get her to stay in the TARDIS. We later find out it's because Twelve has already worked out the list of names, so this is his way of trying to help O'Donnell. However, she's too adventurous and stubborn for her own good, refusing to listen to the Doctor she admires and ultimately being killed because of it. Huh. Remind you of someone? O'Donnell's death is really sad. When she's confronted by the Fisher King and she knows she's about to die, she doesn't scream, she doesn't panic, she just looks frozen in fear, and it's genuinely hard to say goodbye to the short-lived character. There's something especially haunting about her painful sobs as Bennett searches for her. They feel pretty realistic for someone who's just been shot and left to die in agony, so it comes across as a nice bit of authenticity for a death scene. It's also emotional when she puts on a brave face as Bennett holds her in his arms. There's a clear unrealised romance hinted at between these characters, so her death feels extra raw and unfair because it felt like there was so much more she had in her future. This death also gives us that standout moment of Bennett taking the Doctor to task for suddenly taking things seriously now that Clara is next on the list. And you know, he accuses him of using O'Donnell to test a theory. Maybe she stood a chance. Yeah, but you didn't try very hard to stop her though, did you? So far, I haven't said much about Bennett throughout this review, but after spending the first episode as a pretty low-key, geeky science guy, Hey, how's it going? This moment really shows that there's more beneath the surface, with him symbolically removing his glasses and becoming a lot more serious and stoic. Unlike O'Donnell, Bennett doesn't have the idealised vision of the Doctor in his head. He's similar to Series 5 Rory in that aspect, able to see the darker side of the Doctor and calling him out for his attitude towards others. There's even that great moment similar to Father's Day, where the Doctor and Bennett travel back to when they originally landed, but can't warn Prentice or O'Donnell. You can't just go back and cut off tragedy at the root. 
We saw in that Series 1 episode that it's hard to resist the urge to try and do something. After all, they have all this power to travel back in time, but they can't use it to save the people they love, and that would seriously burn inside. So this is a strong reminder of the daily struggles the Doctor and their companions experience when dealing with people from their own timelines. We all know what would have happened if Bennett had tried to interfere, because we had already seen that happen when Rose crossed into her own timeline to save her dad. So it's a nice nod to that earlier story to bring up the same issues with time travel because you know you can't cross your own timeline. Because then you really do see ghosts. And yes, while we're in the past, we meet Alba Prentice, the funeral director who was the first ghost we met in Under the Lake. Just as a side note, I love the Star Wars reference on his business card. Great touch there. Prentice is obviously a Tavolian, the alien race Withouse created for his previous Doctor Who story, The God Complex, so it's nice to see them again here. There's some nice consistency to their desperation to be enslaved by any races they meet, and the script treats them how they kind of deserve to be treated. First proper alien, and he's an idiot. After all, they have no backbone, no integrity, they'll sell anyone out. They're just kind of pathetic as a race, and should be the butt of the joke like we see here and in The God Complex. However, these scenes with Prentice are good for making him more sympathetic. We initially met him as a nameless killer ghost, but this is a reminder that he was once a living, breathing, innocent being who just got caught up in all this because he was the funeral director for the Fisher King who previously enslaved Tivoli. It de-villainizes Prentice and shows us he was never truly evil. He was actually quite nice and friendly. So I adore the stark contrast between the living and dead Prentice because they're so incredibly different. The Fisher King turns out to be not so dead after all, killing Prentice and kickstarting the chain of events that lead to the wider story. The Fisher King is such a terrifying looking villain. We don't get to see him properly for the majority of the episode, just his titanic form stomping along through cracked windows and you know, hearing his roar, which was recorded by none other than Corey Taylor of Slipknot fame. Yeah, that's actually true, and apparently he's a Doctor Who fan too, which is pretty neat. The Doctor's confrontation with the Fisher King is absolutely top notch. They meet in the depths of an abandoned church building and we finally get a proper look at that villain in all his like seven foot glory, towering over the protagonist who can't help but tremble in fear and awe of his adversary. I love the look of the Fisher King, he looks like something Lovecraftian or maybe even something Terry Pratchett would envision. This really unique design, especially the skeletal face. He's almost like a crustacean with his natural armour plating and a shell protecting the back of his head from potential threats and the unrelenting son of his homeworld. There's also a sense of biomechanics with wild wires plugging into his skull and his neck, so there was clearly a lot of thought put into this one-off villain and it makes him so much more visually imposing and threatening. It's also cool how he has knowledge of the Time Lords, taunting the Doctor for the warring nature of his own people. However, this taunting only fires up Twelve, who gets an excellent hero moment as he stands up to the Fisher King and refuses to allow that bleak future to happen. But the way I see it, even a ghastly future is better than no future at all. It's a great Doctor moment as he decides to put things straight and defeat the Fisher King regardless of the effect it might have on time. In a clever, Doctor-like twist, Twelve tricks the Fisher King into leaving the church, opening him up for the destruction of the dam and the flood. I love the lack of music as the power cell explodes. We just hear the explosion and then the creepy whistling of the wind, creating a nice little moment before the music kicks in and the dam properly explodes, flooding the village in the first place to create the lake the story takes place within. A lot of people have always been a bit confused as to why a villain named the Fisher King is defeated by a flood, because you know, his name implies the species are aquatic or water-based. However, the name actually has nothing to do with the underwater setting. It's actually borrowed from Arthurian mythology. This legendary Fisher King was the last of the British kings tasked with guarding the Holy Grail, although a wound left him impotent and his lands barren. You know, he had a pretty bad run of luck. Therefore, he spends all his time fishing while waiting for a chosen one to come along and heal him. Just like how the Fisher King of this story is waiting for his people to come and free him from his suspended animation. There's actually a Delita scene which clarifies that the Fisher King from this story is from a barren and arid world, with his rule over the Tavolians ended by the Arcatenians flooding the planet and drowning him, which helps to explain his ultimate demise at the Doctor's hands. I get why the scene was cut, because you know, it's too long and has some weird comedic elements in it but it was a pretty crucial aspect of the story to be removed. So I wish they had thrown in some ADR somewhere else to explain the villain's origin and why water would destroy him so effectively. The Arcatinians simply raised our sea level, 
flooded our cities and routed the Fisher King and his warriors. When developing the story, Whithouse considered the idea of a curse passing from person to person, drawing its power from an alien life form living within the words themselves. Moffat liked this concept and suggested it could be combined with this ghost story, and I think it works phenomenally. The words themselves are mysterious and creepy, etched into the side of the spaceship, and I love the effect of seeing them reflected in the eyes of anyone who reads them. It's similar to stories like, you guessed it, The Impossible Planet. This idea of untranslatable text is a brilliant narrative tool, keeping the usually all-knowing Doctor just as in the dark as the viewer themselves. The writing on the spaceship ultimately turns out to be an earworm designed to amplify the signal while the Fisher King sits in suspended animation waiting for his people to arrive. But in a brilliant twist, it turns out that the Doctor was the one in suspended animation the whole time, allowing him to get back to the base from the past and trick the villainous ghost into the Faraday cage, ending the threat once and for all. It's a great example of trickery, faking out not only the characters, but also the viewers themselves, because you know, we were led to believe that the suspended animation opening would be doom for everyone because the Fish King would show up and kill everyone, but no, it's just the Doctor, he was just chilling in there the whole time. I appreciate the fact that the story has a nice, lengthy period of post-action, an epilogue exploring how the characters were affected. This is something a lot of Doctor episodes seem to forget to include, but it's a vitally important part of the show's storytelling. It goes through so many characters and locations we never get to see again, so it's important to make sure there's enough time to really wrap things up and give everything a satisfying ending. We get that here as Bennett tries to cope with the loss of O'Donnell, who is now nothing more than a ghost in the Faraday cage. In early scripts, O'Donnell's death would have been revealed as another fake out and she would have been reunited with Bennett at the end, but it was dropped and I think the story is so much better for it. Because you know, we get that chance to explore the loss, with Clara able to draw on her own personal experience of losing Danny. She knows what this feeling is like, so she's able to reassure Bennett and give him something to hold on to, because there's so much more to life that he can enjoy, so he shouldn't live in grief. This perspective also prompts Bennett to give Lun the chance to tell Cass he loves her. Bennett doesn't want them to have the same unrealized love he and O'Donnell have, so it's a really touching character ending. Tell her there's no point in wasting time, because things happen and then it's too late. Series 9 is a series full of incredible stories, but Under the Lake and Before the Flood is up there with Heaven Sent as the best. This two-parter is absolutely phenomenal on every level. The setting is a novel idea, modern Doctor Who's first underwater base, and the ghosts make for a really interesting villain for such a setting, leading to some stellar sci-fi horror vibes throughout the story. The Fisher King only comes into the picture in Before the Flood, but he's a very unique and intimidating villain with such a creative look. The supporting cast also perfectly written and brought to life, with authentic performances making them truly feel like actual people, O'Donnell and Cass being the best examples of this. It's a story full of fascinating concepts, especially its exploration of the bootstrap paradox and the storytelling builds up the overall Series 9 story arc of the relationship between the Doctor and Clara. The difference in the settings of both episodes creates a great sense of pacing and variety, keeping things fresh. It's a very atmospheric story from end to end, and it mixes sci-fi horror and humanity in a way only Doctor Who could ever really do. Therefore, not that it's any surprise, I'm giving this two-parter an S rank on the Series 9 tier list. I find it really hard to find any substantial faults in the two episodes. They achieved so much in such an entertaining way, and since they were the first of the series to be filmed, Weirhouse's vision was able to be fully realized without too many budgetary constraints. The sets are gorgeous, the characters engaging, and the villains are terrifying, while the Doctor and Clara are fun and entertaining the whole time. So you know, what else could you ask for in a Doctor Who story? Even if you're not a fan of Series 9, Under the Lake and Before the Flood are always worth a watch, and I'll never not see it as one of the best two-parters of the entire Moffat era. What do you think? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time for, you know, that awkward time Doctor Who tried to use Game of Thrones for clout. Bye bye. And a special thank you to my Asbantium level patrons, Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson, my Diamond level patron, Glenna Clark, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman and Nick's Games, and all my Gold level patrons, Boots, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Francois AK Line Vortex, Herna Verzog, Robert Hock, and Tom Azar. Thank you so much for your support.